Well, hi there and welcome. It's great to have you here for this guided meditation and Dharma talk. My name is Jonathan Faust. I'm grateful that you're making the time to be here. Uh, before we launch our traditional thank yous, uh, first of all, um, a thank you to Rita Moran, our mindful movement teacher for today. And a big thank you to Ray Maniocchi and Tara Cassidy, who are now back again offering mindful dialogue after this session. Uh, if you like, you can follow a link to spend a little time with those who would like to share thoughts about the talk, to share thoughts about your practice. The whole Monday night experience is uh, 6.30 Eastern Standard Time. You can do mindful movement to prepare you for meditation. And then we move right into our meditation at 7.30 and on to the talk. After the talk, um, mindful dialogue with Ray and Tara. So those links are on my Facebook page and also on my website. Also, I want to thank our producers, Glenn Harrison and Leo Gimo, for all you do for producing this. Thank you so much. Also, as well, a thank you to the Insight Meditation Community of Washington for hosting this. Just to let you know, as well, I do have a, uh, a newsletter that I send out monthly with a compendium of talks, with, uh, also with my photography for the month. And just to say thank you, as well, for your support. Uh, a lot of energy, a lot of time, and real-time expense go into making these talks available freely so no one's denied access. And your help is deeply, deeply appreciated. You can make donations through my website, a variety of ways to do that. Mostly, it's just great to be able to share these practices with you. There's so many people all over the planet. I'm happy to be here. We're going to explore uh, this evening... Uh, short meditation, and then into our talk on intention. I've been doing some practicing, Tara and both Tara and I have been doing some practice with intention, and um, it really is the tip of the spear. It's, it's life-changing. So I'm excited to share some of my thoughts and my experience uh, on this, and I hope it's helpful. So before then, before we launch into the talk, let's take a little time for meditation and for centering. So please feel free, reach your arms up overhead, let out any sounds, adjust your posture in any way that feels right for you. And we're going to move into a 15 minute meditation, maybe a little bit less. So better hurry up and relax. <laughs> if you like, you can close your eyes and you know, Speaking of relaxation, if you like, draw your shoulders up toward your ears. Make your, your neck disappear. Take in a long, deep breath. Hold the breath and squeeze the shoulders. Holding just to your comfort level and then consciously relax, drop the shoulders and just feel inside, along the shoulders and neck, this transition from contraction to holding and letting go. And then if you would, make your hands into fists, tighten up your forearms, your biceps, your triceps. Again, draw your shoulders up toward your ears, hold this contraction, take it a long, deep inhalation. Hold the breath and squeeze. A little tighter and relax with the exhalation. Drop the shoulders and feel. Over the next three breaths, how much more could soften and relax right now? And once again, draw the hands up into fists, tighten up the forearms, the biceps, the triceps, muscles across the shoulder blades, muscles across the top of your chest, draw the knees up, <laughs> the knees, <laughs> drop the shoulders up toward your ears, draw your navel in toward your spine, pull the muscles of your face up toward your nose, make your face into a raisin, inhale, hold the breath. A little bit tighter. And relax. 
relax. <sighs> Drop the shoulders. Over the next three exhalations, again, how much more right now could soften and relax and let go. Notice the sounds around you. Feel the temperature of the air against your skin. And notice, if you can, this quality of noticing. What is it that is aware right now? You might take a few moments to make contact with the breath on the inside. Notice where you feel the breath the most predominant right now. And you might, if you like, just for the next, say, three to five breaths on each exhalation, how much more could you soften and let go? Feel the weight of your arms from the inside. Feel your face expressionless. Could you relax your face in such a way that your face might feel like the face of a marble statue? Forehead smooth, the jaw relaxed. Relaxing the tongue, the lips. Is it possible to both soften the palms of the hands and at the same time soften the soles of the feet? And you might now bring your attention to a particular focal point. For many, the breath is a powerful anchor. But you might also like to explore the real-time sounds as they're happening, or maybe the sense of feeling or pulse in the palms. And for this next period of time, these next few minutes, let your attention, as best you can, rest at the point of your anchor, breath, sound, or feeling, sensing from the inside. And when you notice the mind naturally wandering away, the power of this practice is to refocus, to draw your attention back without judgment to experience from the inside breath, sound, or the feeling in the palms.
might notice that when the mind has wandered away, there's a natural inclination for some form of self-judgment or recrimination. You might explore if it's possible to associate a sense of pleasure with waking up when the mind is lost. Can you find pleasure in re-relaxing and softening? Can you find a sense of ease and pleasure as you, again, sense from the inside the movement of breath, sound, or feeling? You might gently sense both the anchor, but as well the background, widening, broadening your attention, sensing what's changing. Noticing what's happening as it's happening. At the same time, noticing the attitude in your mind and your capacity to let things be. You might explore now. In this remaining minute or so, transitioning from a sense of doing to a sense of being. To explore what it means to simply rest in presence, letting the focus on your anchor fall away. And noticing if you can relax and soften even more now. deeply relaxed and at the same time alert and awake to the flow of your experience. Now letting all technique fall away. What could soften right now? What could let go? And you might gently begin to lengthen your breath a bit. Let your head drift a little bit from the left to the right. Let your body begin to move and stretch in any way that feels good. And take this time for your transition.
welcome. I heard someone share earlier, and they said the following. You know, this morning, my wife said I'm a terrible listener. Well, at least that's what I think she said. I wasn't really paying attention. This summer, Tara, my wife and I did an experiment. Every morning we stated our intention for the day. And before we went to bed, at the end of the day, we shared any observations as to how that intention showed up or how it kind of failed to show up. And with this experiment, I we were both a little skeptical. It's a little new agey, but I was feeling a little adrift and I like the idea of focusing my brain a little more. And our intentions were pretty much on the same theme. Tara's intention was, if I remember, <laughs> was on the theme of kind of living in loving awareness and living in loving presence. And mine was along the lines of like being in flow. I kind of wanted to be in the flow state, man. You know, that state when you're relaxed but concentrated and the moment's just kind of opening up and you're feeling creativity just happening by itself. I wanted more of those moments. So that was my intention. And it was a very interesting experiment. This is like for a month or six weeks. And while a lot happened, a few things stick out in my mind. Once was when we got into this flash argument and snarled at each other with a, with a fair bit of intensity. <laughs> it was not exactly living in living awareness. And another moment when I realized I kind of woke up out of a trance where I was watching these insipid YouTube clips for an for a embarrassingly long time. And I realized I was in flow, but it was not the kind of flow that I wanted. <laughs> You know those times when you, you get on YouTube to research something specific and like three hours later you're watching drunk Siberian men bear wrestling with bears? You know, the curious thing about an intention is that it sharpens your attention. And while Tara indeed was more aware of when she was not in a state of loving presence, she was actually a lot more in that state of loving presence and loving awareness than previously. And the truth is, I was way more aware when I was not in a flow state, but I also experienced a lot more flow than I had previously. This whole piece around intention is so, it's exciting to me. Having clear intentions can change your life. So what I would like to talk about is kind of the failure of having an intention when, you're, when your ego is in charge of autopilot. And secondly, I'd like to talk about when you do have an intention, when you find a star in the sky and you, you keep your hand on the tiller, what that's like. I'd also like to explore a little bit about the difference between an aspiration and an intention. They work together, but they're different. And then finally, if we have time, uh, how to use intentions strategically. And specifically, what I'd like to think of as segment intentions. So how, do you, how do you break them down in the small moments of your day when you can sharpen what it is that you really, really want? So it's very interesting how to not have an intention and how your conditioning, your egoic structure is, is running things. You're, you're on, we're all on a sense of autopilot. So I'm really interested in in the whole concept of autopilot because it's a new technology out there that's really going to change our culture. So a Tesla has an autopilot function and there, there, there are two levels of autopilot. One kind of comes standard with the car and then there's the full self-driving. But the autopilot is it's amazing. It's actually been around for about 10 years and it's, it's remarkably good. How it does, this is how it does it. It has got a car has eight cameras. There, there are three at the windshield that are kind of scanning. There's one aimed way out ahead. There's a radar that's scanning way out ahead. 
And then there are cameras around the sides of the car and the back of the car. And then there are 12 sensors around the car that use ultrasound, kind of like shooting out radio waves. And it creates this cocoon of sensing around the car. And then it has a chip. This blows my mind. There's a chip in the car that is capable of 26 trillion elements of input per second. So when you're in a Tesla that's driving down the road and you're on autopilot, you've got this sensing machine that's just scanning, processing information way faster than the human brain. And then it's either exciting or scary. It's also feeding back all that information back to headquarters among the many, many cars or 500 Teslas just in the last year that were sold, all this information is being processed. So the car is scanning for danger and it's also scanning for clear open roads and course correcting all the time. And this is what our brain does as well. It's looking for threats and then it's course correcting. And it's really interesting when you're doing meditation, when you're focusing, say, on the breath, at some point, your mind will wander, or maybe your mind has wandered a couple of times in meditation. <laughs> and then there's this function of something wakes up and then it course corrects, and then you come back to focus. It's very, very interesting. Now, the studies on the brain and what happens with neuroplasticity and meditation and part of, the, part of the whole thing around focus, the benefit of, of focus in meditation is very powerful, but it's the power of refocus that's part of training your brain. So it's not just focusing on the breath, it's when you notice your mind has wandered and you refocus. All these synapses get strengthened. So course correction is an amazing function, of course. But a Tesla depends on programming. Now, the program's been out there for about 10 years, and it's gotten a lot smarter. But at some points, there were some objects that the Tesla didn't recognize. It wasn't in the programming. So there were some pretty hairy moments of a car not perceiving something through the autopilot. and then creating a crash. Like I believe, if I'm not mistaken, you know, the highway trucks with the big signs on the back, at some point it wasn't in the programming, so the car didn't see it. On the other hand, there's something in Tesla's called phantom braking, where the car perceives a problem that's not there. So you're on autopilot, kind of the open highway, and the car goes, wait, wait, what's that? And it'll slow down or stop or hit the brakes. Uh, at one point, when there was water on the highway and it was reflecting the clouds that wasn't in the program. The car didn't recognize it. So why am I sharing all this? <laughs> well, Teslas are pretty cool. Uh, autopilot's going to change our culture. But, but here's the thing. When your life is on autopilot and your programming is not in tune with reality, well, what's going to happen? Well, you're going to perceive things that aren't there. You're going, to, you're going to think things are true that aren't true. And you're not going to see things that are actually there. Based solely on your conditioning, on your programming, you're going to base your whole life trajectory on that information and never change it. And I'm sure you know people in your life that will probably never change. Or... They might change, but only for one reason. When they crash into something, when life is painful enough to have you second guess the programming, that's when you're going to make a change. Pain is a very powerful way to reorient your intention. This is a great story about the late basketball player, Kobe Bryant. 
In one of his playoff games in his rookie year, he threw four air balls. That is to say, he took a shot and he didn't even hit the backboard. People ridiculed him. He was supposed to be this great new kid coming on and, you know, the great new star. He was 18 years old. He skipped college. He was so pained by that that he trained like never before. He decided that he was going to outwork any other player in the NBA. So he worked out hard. He took shot after shot after shot. He refocused his intention. He reprogrammed himself. Three years later, they won a championship. So this is a little what I'd like to share with you. How do you make sure the programming for your autopilot is not based on your fears or based on delusional desire, but in alignment with reality? When you shift from an ego-driven autopilot to a reality-based autopilot, Life is different. <laughs> so it comes down to the question, what do you really, 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 really want? Knowing that life on this plane is destined to go poof, how do you want to live this life? Well, that's a whole thing. And we could spend the rest of our time reflecting on that, but I'll, I'll leave that to you. But one way to discern this is to look around. You know, who has what you want? Who's living a life the way that you would like to live your life? Uh, Neuro-linguistic programming has this great thing that says if you find someone who has what you want, if you do exactly what they do, then you'll have what they have. And fortunately, we can look around and we can see people who are inspiring and see people who maybe are indicators of how we don't want to live. There are lots of examples of how not to live a life out there. But there's some really interesting, really interesting examples of inspiring lives. You know, Thich Nhat Hanh speaks of the intention or the aspiration of, of being on a boat. Well, when you're navigating in a boat in the ocean, how you navigate is you, you find the star and then you set your course by that star. They're wonderful, wonderful examples of how to live this life. But if you're inspired by the teachings of the Buddha, there's a profound way to tune into that intention. And if you've ever done a classical meditation retreat, like a classical meditation retreat, before you begin, you reflect on the precepts. You reflect on, on five vows that you take as a way of sharpening your intention. And having led the precepts and taken the precepts, you're basically taking the vows of a monk when you, when you go on a retreat. I'd like to talk a little bit about these, these particular vows and how how we apply them and the kind of the, the nature, the structure of them. So how I would like to do this is to kind of offer this, to imagine, if you would, that it is the first night of a meditation retreat. You're about to dedicate many, many days to silence and to practice. And imagine, if you like, that you're joining others in practice and not just the people around you, but you are joining the countless of other people over thousands of years who have reflected on, on these particular vows, these particular intentions. If you'd like, you can close your eyes, not necessary, but take a few moments as I share these just to kind of sense how they resonate for you. I undertake the precept to abstain from harming living beings. I undertake the precept to abstain from taking that which is not freely given.
I undertake the precept to speak without being abusive or exploitive. I undertake the precept to abstain from sexuality that is exploitive or abusive. I undertake the precept to refrain from intoxicating my mind and to end heedless behavior. You might just take a few moments and just sense what would your life feel like inside if you refrain from harming living beings? If you abstain from taking anything that is not freely given to you? If you abstain from speaking in a harmful way to others? If you abstain from sexuality that would create harm? And if you kept your mind clear? If you liked, you can deepen your breath. If you like, you can open your eyes. It's interesting that these precepts, that these intentions or aspirations have been around for a couple thousand years. I'm not offering these in any fundamentalist ways. You have to make a way, you have to find what works for you. And it's very, very interesting to see how, how we kind of individuate around these intentions. They can be interpreted in all kinds of ways. The intention not to harm living beings. Well, on the one extreme, we have the Jain monks, these beautiful monks who sweep the ground in front of them so as not to harm any bugs. They, they have a screen in front of their face so they, they might not inhale a bug and kill it. Then there are other traditions in Buddhism where it's okay to eat meat, but not to personally kill the animal. In terms of not taking anything that is not freely given, again, on the one end, you have monks who have their alms bowls. All they have is the kind of the sheet that they wear and they beg for food. They take nothing that isn't freely given. On the other hand, you have others who are living in the world and they, they tithe 10% of their earnings. In terms of non-harming speech, there are those who take vows of silence so as to not create harm and also so as to not break, to break the connection with presence. Then there are others who apply that precept by, by using practices like nonviolent communication to be, to be more aware of the harm that they create and to use words for healing. In terms of refraining from creating sexual harm, there are those who take celibacy vows, a very, very strict and rigid focus. And then there are those who engage in this sexuality in a spiritual way, erring on the side of non-harming. In terms of the precept of not taking intoxicating substances, we have examples such as um, Christian science, where you use only prayer. You take nothing external in your body other than food. And then, of course, now with all the, the research and the exploration of psychotropic uh, medicines, plant medicines, this practice of very, very mindfully using substances as a way to become more awake and more alive in your life. So there are all kinds of ways to apply these precepts. And each one of us has to find a way to articulate how to align actions with intention. So just a little bit more on kind of the classical dharma around intention. First of all, what is it that gets in the way of being fully awake? Well, 
you could say mindless desire, trying to satisfy the senses as a way of being fully awake is a, maybe not the best strategy. When the mind is overtaken by ill will, by anger, judgment, blame, hatred. And when we are caught in mindless acts of creating harm. So you could say there are three kinds of intention. One is the intention of renunciation, which is about countering desire, where your intention is, I will not do these things. I will abstain from these things. Then there are the intentions that have to do with, with goodwill, uh, countering ill will by the things you're going to do. I will do these things as an extension of my of my goodwill to others. The third form of intention is about harmlessness, about countering mindless, harmful behavior. When you take the time to really reflect on whether your actions align with your aspiration and, and intention, your life begins to change. It's classic, classic teaching in this particular tradition. These words ostensibly from the Buddha. All that we are is the result of what we have thought. It is founded on our thoughts. It is made up of our thoughts. If a person speaks or acts with an evil thought, pain follows this person as the wheel follows the foot of the ox that draws the carriage. All that we are is a result of what we have thought. It is founded on our thoughts. It is made up of our thoughts. If a person speaks or acts with a pure thought, happiness follows this person like a shadow that never leaves them. When you pause, and when you slow down, and when you ask yourself, what is most important in your life? And when you reflect on what actions align with your aspiration or intention, there can be a wonderful sense of focus, a wonderful sense of living in alignment. So simple to say, <laughs> so not easy to do. And there's a distinction I'd like to share about the difference between an intention and an aspiration. I've shared this before, but when Tara and I got married, we thought we would work the Bodhisattva vow into our marriage vows. And so we declare to each other, may whatever arise serve the awakening of heart and mind and be of benefit to all. Such a beautiful aspiration. May whatever arise serve the awakening of heart and mind and be of benefit to all. Now, I thought a lot about that intention and that aspiration because I was sharing it in front of a bunch of people. <laughs> I felt kind of beholden to it. And one of the powerful things around intention is to ask why. Like, why is that aspiration important to me? And to me, it is the expression of, of a fully, fully alive life. It gets my heart going. Now, the aspiration is kind of like a floodlight. It's the it's the broad spectrum aspiration. And intention is more like a spotlight. And so when I break that aspiration down to something specific, let's say with my wife, my intention may be for this check-in we have today, I'm going to be fully present. And you can sense the difference. 
The floodlight is your overall aspiration. The spotlight is your intention for, for a segment. So the question becomes, what, what do you aspire to in life? You know, at the end of your life, what will have been most important to you? And then aligning this, perhaps your aspiration may be around wanting to be happy, wanting to be deeply at peace, wanting to be free from suffering. And with an aspiration like that, the floodlight of that, then what intentions can you use to bring it into today? Recently, I had a difficult conversation with someone. Well, the aspiration was to be happy, <laughs> at peace and free, for whatever to arise through the awakening of heart and mind. But my intention for that conversation was to be present, to listen, to seek to understand the other person's point of view. That was a little more crystallized for me. So someone shared their uh, New Year's resolutions over the years. 2018, I will meditate every day for 30 minutes. 2019, I will set aside some time for meditation every day. 2020, I will meditate as often as possible. 2021, I will pause each morning while I'm tying my shoes. <laughs> We have to align our actions. And there was definitely um, a process of getting more real over the years. And I've certainly found that for myself. You know, my intention is to write a thousand words every day. And finally getting, okay, my intention is to write every day, write something every day. So it's great to have these lofty aspirations, but we need to align them with actions. And as they say in Zen, there are only enlightened actions. That is to say, when your actions are aligned with your aspiration, that's an enlightened action. So something I'd love to share with you with a little bit of time I have left. And this is a very kind of strategic way of applying intentions. There's something that's called time chunking. It's a new way of like, not it's new, it's been around forever, but a way of kind of designing your day. We're taking chunks of time and blocking them off into your calendar. So you will have, when you look at your calendar for the day, you will block off, say, an hour for a project that you're working on. That you will block off 45 minutes for doing your email. And many people find that chunking your time out like that, it really helps you to kind of focus, you know, for the next half hour, I'm going to do this and you do that and you focus. In that same way that your, your day is kind of broken into chunks, you can clarify your intentions for those chunks. When you think about how many separate actions do you have in a day? There's waking up, there's preparing for your day, how many different interactions do you have during a day? How many separate tasks do you have in a day? How many meals do you have in a day? You know, what kind of self-care do you have during a day? The whole, the whole day is filled up with all these different separate activities. And it can be very interesting to reflect on specific intentions for each, for each segment. Just to pause and kind of ask yourself, what is my intention for this? And to ask why. So when I sit down and I'm chunking out, okay, I have an hour to work on this Dharma talk. Why is this important? What is my intention? And my intention may be, my intention is to share something that could be potentially transformative. Well, why is that important? because these practices can mean the difference between suffering and freedom. Well, that gets me pumped up for that hour. In a sermon the Buddha gave to his son, Rahula, he talked about 
how you need to consider before, during, and after every action, whether it might be abusive or generally rooted in intent. What that requires is you have to be clear. You have to discern what is the result of my actions here? Could there be some negative consequences? Could this possibly be a way that would open up new possibilities and serve? When we can do that, it can mean all the difference. It certainly has for me. So in a very practical way, I wanted to share a couple of things that you can do around creating intention. I played around with this a little bit. First of all, if you can find a word or a phrase that's significant for you. So for, for whatever reason, my intention to be in flow was really important to me. I really wanted to, to kind of bring myself back from kind of being lost in the mind, you know, lost in judgment, lost in anxiety, and get into a flow state where I'm absorbed, where I'm creative, where it's kind of flowing through me. And so for me, I just chose the word flow. And that became like a little bit of a mantra. And again, it's like, you know, a mantra, you don't hang on to a mantra tightly. You, you hold it loosely as something you kind of come back to. So to have your intention as a word or a phrase is really, really helpful. I found it really helpful to also to say, out, say it out loud, to kind of share it. And there is something very powerful about speaking aloud your intention to a friend. Someone who can be there as, a, as an ally. Many people find it helpful to create a ritual around your intention. And part of the ritual, and many people have found, is if you can bring it to a gesture of some kind. And, and one of the most powerful gestures, perhaps, is simply to kind of bring your hand to your heart. So for me, when I think, okay, bring my hand to my heart, my intention is to, is to be in flow, to access flow. It just has a kind of a kinesthetic quality that can be really, really helpful. It's helpful to bring, bring yourself into like a meditation on, on your intention to ask yourself why it's important. That question of why is this important can have such a powerful way of kind of enlivening emotion, enlivening, enlivening passion. Another way to explore is to ask yourself, what would it feel like if this intention was fully expressed? Again, I found that helpful for myself as well. What would flow feel like? It gives you a little, a little taste, a little, a little sense of it right there. Now, the teacher Adyashanti kind of offers this, where he says, well, ask yourself what you want, your intention, and then ask yourself, is it true that it is not already here? There's something really powerful about that. The other is to look for evidence that it's happening. And that could be a very powerful way of kind of like reaffirming your, your intention. And it's also very, very helpful if you can report and review how well you did, either through journaling or reflection, or ideally if there was someone you could talk to around creating an intention. And look for ways that you can remind yourself as well. I've shared this story before, but a long time ago, you know, I had like the Iron Man watch and I created an intention. I was set my watch to go off every hour. 
And I create a ritual where I would take a long, deep breath and then kind of remind myself of my intention. Um, it was very powerful at first, and then it became just annoying. <laughs> you know, my watch would go off and I'd say like 80% of the time I would have like a genuine sense of, oh, yes, yes, yeah, take a breath, feel it. Um, so I kind of let it go after a while because it lost its impact. But now whenever anyone's alarm watch goes off, I, I automatically take a breath. So that's kind of this Pavlovian thing kind of built into my nervous system. When you, when you live without intention, you are like a sailboat without a rudder. Wherever the wind goes, that's where you go. Desire runs the mind, aversion runs the mind, confusion runs the mind. When things are aligned, when you have your aspiration, the floodlight, when you have your intention, the spotlight, when you are aware why that's important and why, there can be a quality of centering, uh, a quality of, of arriving, and a quality of purpose that might make a big difference in your life. So I'd like to close with a short little reflection on, on intention. So if you like, you can close your eyes. This will be just for a few minutes. And you might like to, again, close your eyes. And take three slow, deep breaths. And you might reflect on, let's make it specific, uh, something going to happen later today or tomorrow. Take a few moments to kind of settle into a particular event that lies ahead. And take a few moments to think of your, what is your intention? How would you like to feel at the end? And could you summarize your intention in a word or a phrase? You might like to bring your hand to your heart and, and ask yourself why this intention is so important to you. What would it feel like if this intention was fully expressed? What would that feel like inside? Feel the breath. Imagine what that would feel like. If you were to share your intention with another person, who might that person be? Or you might imagine writing it down in your journal. And can you imagine this intention happening? What would it look like externally if your intention was expressed through your actions? Is there a sense of what you would need, what would support you? And in these final moments, you might again refresh the sense of the word or the phrase. And you might explore this question. If this intention was already here, what would it feel like? What would it be like inside?
If you like, you can deepen the breath. If you like, you can open your eyes. There's tremendous power in taking time to ask yourself what is most important in your life. To have an aspiration that aligns you with your heart, your values. It's helpful to look around. Is there anyone else who's already doing it? That might be a model. What are they doing? How are they living? And to reflect on what it's like to align your actions with your aspirations. There is this possibility, and it's not about doing it perfectly. It's not about doing it all the time. But to think of the, the chunks in your day, the, the segments in your day, where you might just take a few moments and pause and ask yourself, what is most important here? How do I want to feel at the end? Why is this significant to me? And to ask yourself if that intention was fully expressed, what would it look like? That doesn't have to be a long process. It can be just a few moments, a few breaths. And just sense what it might be like to move into the individual parts of your day with perhaps a little more clarity about what, what's most important to you and how your actions might align with what's most important to you. I hope you have found this helpful. I find this stuff to be really juicy. It kind of, it just gets me excited about being more aware, more aligned in my life. And I hope this might be for you as well. Thank you so much for your time and attention. May you, your aspirations, your intentions, and your actions be aligned. May they all have a wonderful time together and many, many blessings. I look forward to being with you again.